All set? Let's go. Off Zulu Victor is holding Bravo ready for departure. I'm Gotam Lewis and I am the CEO of Freedom in the Air. Freedom in the Air enables disabled people to fly higher socially, physically and professionally. It's the end of 2015 and I've been filming Tony Rapson since May, starting at Aero Expo, which is held at Cywell Aerodrome here in the UK. I've come to the 10th Aero Expo. Aero Expo is to keep the enthusiasts in aviation interested in what's going on. Tony is the boss of the Civil Aviation Authority's General Aviation Unit, the department responsible for regulating the UK's recreational flying. I wanted to make this film in order to clarify the General Aviation Unit's role as well as dispel some of the misconceptions that the flying public has about it. I hope this film will give the GA community a deeper understanding of Tony's and his hard-working team's efforts towards making the general aviation, or GA sector, the envy of the world. The UK obviously has a great lineage and heritage in not only aerospace, but also aviation. How do you uh, evaluate the last year and a bit that you've had at the GA unit? It's been a really exciting year, slightly longer than a year in terms of what the GA unit has been doing, but a huge amount of change achieved already uh, so that GA in the UK gets a better deal and the deal it deserves. The GA unit is mainly involved in regulating the businesses that support private pilot sector. However, as Tony explains, there is more to the GA unit than most realise. If I could change one thing in the UK for general aviation, one thing, it would be the weather. But you're be not God. No, but I'm not God. <laughs> I can't wish the world to be other than it is. The, the GA unit is a, is a national aviation authority in microcosm. It's airworthiness, it's operations, it's policy, and it's people who understand general aviation. So there's a lot of pilot licenses in there, engineers in there, I uh, have a balloon specialist because we look after balloons, uh, and they're all dedicated to regulating GA more proportionately and doing a good job. But one of the challenges I see for the GA community when I go out there is how do you bring more people into aviation? So it's never going to be a cheap hobby. How do you make aviation exciting for youngsters that are brought up on, on video games and, and a different form of excitement? But that's what we need to look at, to get more people into aviation and allow the industry to grow. So how would you measure your success in the last year and a bit. One of the things I do is, is now, a year on, walking around Aero Expo, the number of people I've spoken to that recognise me, have acknowledged the work that the GA unit and the CAA are doing. It's got to be about whether or not the uh, GA community, the GA industry in the UK, can start to grow again and deliver um, training for overseas students uh, and in the UK. And there's much more at play in that than just the, the regulatory oversight and, and that type of thing. One of the challenges to the growth of GA is access to airspace. So I wonder whether you think the Directorate of Airspace Policy is on message to what you're trying to inspire in terms of engagement and a take up and a growth. The future airspace strategy is key because if we can bring in the changes of the future airspace strategy, push the commercial traffic up, that will free airspace at the lower levels uh, and make it easier to operate. The challenge that airspace regulation faces is it, it does have a statutory duty to take account of the owners and, and operators of all types and classes of aircraft. Uh, that's not the same as giving everybody exactly what they want, but they do have to take that into account. 
and fulfil the CAA statutory responsibility to protect the consumer, to protect the customer, to protect third parties, however you want to phrase it. Airspace is a national asset, it is a scarce resource, uh, it is always going to be challenging, but with the future airspace strategy and the future airspace strategy VFR implementation group, that's how those things are trying to be addressed, how the CAA and, and airspace regulation will take account of all users. But we've got to ask ourselves, what is it that, that we can do, both the CAA and the community, in terms of electronic conspicuity, in terms of e instrument rating qualifications, to make access to airspace, uh, even regulated airspace, easier to achieve? Uh, and these things we're going to, to have to do. What we hope we've produced is a new, a new and better syllabus that's actually suited to what people need to know today and not what might have been relevant 20 or 30 years ago. And something that's relevant at PPL and let light aircraft pilot level, not what people want to know to fly airliners. And we hope that people will start to adopt it and start to use it and see the advantages of training, training for the 21st century. Okay, so the first control we're going to look at is the elevator, which controls the aircraft in pitch around the lateral axis. I, I like planes anyway, and I want, I want a future within planes. And as this came, it just made me a lot better. A lack of young people specialising in STEM subjects that science, technology, engineering and maths at school and at college remains a real concern for the aerospace, private and commercial flying industry. We see the engine and which is powered by the Jebru, um, the Jebru J2200. Come back to the point I made earlier about getting younger people into aviation, that's not just as pilots. Um, the, the maintenance organisations I have visited is there are very few young people coming into there. Now, the, um, uh, some organisations are looking at saving up apprenticeships, the government are trying to encourage more apprenticeships, uh, and that will help, but it's how we keep them in general aviation and, uh, and that conundrum, don't lose them all to the, to the big airlines. Building um, planes and cars is not just for boys because girls do it as well and it's really fun. In terms of PPL training, then I, then I haven't got a, a complete handle on yet, is how many just want to be leisure pilots and how many are real hours builders just wanting to go on to CPL and ATPL and where that split sits. Because you talk to some people and, and the whole of the training industry is just about going through to commercial training. Um, but, but I see a lot of people out there who are just PPL sounds dismissive, but I don't want to mean that, but just people who want to fly as yeah. private pilots. Yeah. And we'll never go on to that. And, and it just doesn't, I can't get a clear view of it at the moment, but it's, it's, we need both. I've always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to, to get the freedom to, you know, just freedom being in the air. And f to me, freedom means so much. It's now the end of August, and I've invited Tony to Elstree Aerodrome in North London so that he can meet fellow aviators and go flying with me. I, I wanted today to be a little bit more about yeah. us connecting with you as person to person, yeah. but two sides of an industry coming together in the middle with a focus today on, I think, more the accessible, inclusive, yeah. gender equal side of GA. For me, general aviation is about giving everybody um, access to this glamorous world of aviation, what people perceive to be really glamorous, elite, um, expensive, and actually opening that up to anybody who's excited and who wants to, who wants to learn to fly. Tony isn't given much time outside of his office to visit airfields and I think he's enjoying this relatively rare opportunity to witness a flying school's daily operations firthand. Let me show you just our newest plane oh, yes, very quickly yes, sure. and then we'll go to the plane. Is that okay, go. Ivan, 
flight training London's chief flying instructor, takes the opportunity to show Tony the school's latest training aircraft. I'm waiting to show Tony how easily I install the hand control, then carry out the pre-flight checks. There is nothing quite in the air navigation order that says you have to check your own oil. <laughs> yes. Before each flight, pilots do what's called a walk around. We visually check things like the fuel level and make sure the flying controls are working properly. This is a simple check making sure the plane is good to fly. Pilots with lower limb disabilities, like me, need to use hand controls in order to be able to operate the rudder pedals. Hand controls are easy to install and let the pilot safely control the plane on the ground and in the air. Designed in Australia, it's called the Vision Air. Yep. It was half designed by Gypsilin Aeronautics and it was then the other half was designed by a lady called Susie Duncan. She's a commercial pilot. Oh, yes. She's in a wheelchair, CPL, IR, flight instructor rating. It's very simple. The one part is attached to the left vertical pedal. Yep. You still have the toe brakes in. That bit has to be installed by a part 66 engineer. Yes, yeah. And the handle is connected in just a few seconds, secured via two pit pins. And it works on the leverage moment. When you go down, yeah, yeah. the left pedal goes down nose goes left and when you're going up you're literally pulling that yes so the instructor has dual controls but for the disabled pilot they can use the handbrake yeah oh, Sula, Lita, take off your discretion two eight zero six knots so we're going to take off and turn right cracking speeds building We're going to get a few eddies from those trees on your left. Yeah. So the runway should be over your right shoulder. Shoulder, yeah. The wind's going to be from our left, pushing us that way. There's Watford. So that's the noise abatement order for circus, yes. is those houses on the left. We can put our yeah, drag course, flap away. Ready for departure. So how did that feel for someone who took you in a plane with a hand control? It's lovely. No different. <laughs> the only thing that surprised me was the wave in the runway, which is not there well, for you. Well, <laughs> they need to resurface the yeah, tarmac. Yeah, and but, that as well. Uh, how do you describe Ride this it, to uh. a non-flyer? Well, that's part of the problem, you can't. <laughs> it, it is something that's beyond description, and there is a difference between sitting here in the right-hand seat yes. and sitting in yes. the left-hand seat and yes. controlling it as yes. it's within your control. And yes. you know, We all know the physics, that if you're trimmed out and stable, it stays there, but actually it's you that affects what happens and controls the physics. Do you know, when I first started flying, I didn't like turning left and right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to make a gentle turn to the right, because I didn't like looking down there. Oh, uh, right, yeah. <laughs> Does your disability define who you are? No, not at all. No, no, no. No, no, I put my legs on in the morning and I just walk out the door and I don't think anything about it. It's also due to the people that I'm going to come back here and, and get my PPL. Yes! I just passed my flight test and that feels really good. So uh, that was a good experience. Good thing. Everything went well. Back in the air, we continue discussing the future of GA. It's not the learning to fly, because you set yourself up with a budget, you know what it's yep. going to cost. It gets more difficult once you're qualified, because yep. every pound you spend on flying is a pound off yes. something else. Yes. So it, there is an element of uh, a two-pronged approach, making it as easy as possible to get in, driving down costs and barriers, and, and the medical standard um, is one. So removing the barriers where we mm. can, but recognising mm. it always costs and then encouraging people yeah. not to give up, to yeah. go on and do more and, yeah. and learn. How does that grow the industry? How does that make flying schools take up more students? Regulation in itself will never encourage more people to go flying. All we can do as the regulator is make sure the companies have the freedom to operate and be effective businesses. So where we are now is we're going up, we've just, we've, we turned left at that motorway we're now on that radial to this beacon. Yeah. We're at 2,200 feet, but there is that feeling of there's a boundless world, world out there. Yes, yeah, it's all fabulous there. 
from my perspective, having learnt to fly in the southern England, because the airspace is busy and there's lots of tiers and it goes from uncontrolled to controlled to yeah. TMA, I, I, I love learning around here heard stories about people coming back from the States and others and, and giving up because they can't cope with the complexities of the, the south of England. Mm. Uh, say stories, I don't mm. know how true they are. And also stories from the microlight end where they learn at a small strip yeah. and then, yeah. uh, yeah. uh, frightened is too strong a word, but you know they very, they struggle with going sure. to a larger aerodrome or any, anything else. And it's, yeah. it makes sense if you can learn in the airspace you're going to do, um, it's just a sensible thing to do. Yeah. At the core, it's about this. Yeah. Our focus is recreational activity. People taking part in a recreational activity like any other recreational activity. And the what has happened over the years is the regulation for aviation has been built up on powered aircraft, gliders, balloons. And it's challenging all the time, actually, what is the level of regulation that is needed for a recreational activity? What's the common sense approach? What that challenging everything, what is the value that, that's added by a particular piece of regulation? So up there will be Leighton Buzzard and yeah. then going back to Milton Keynes and Cranfield. My, my favourite flying memory, I, I have to say probably it was when I first went solo. Clear of cloud, clear of everything else. Safety is the paramount consideration for all pilots which is why we encourage our qualified pilots to undergo regular check flights with an instructor in order to practice emergency situations such as stalling or engine failures. OK, okay select carburetor heat, please. Power, zero. Right off. Now, resist the nose if we let go, just let go, let go. The nose wants to pitch down because we've reduced the power. Yeah. OK, hand on again. Got it. Back pressure, and we're attempting to maintain our altitude mm -hmm. with the elevator. You're getting a reduced airspeed. you got the store warner starting to moan at us. Mm -hmm. We'll get a little bit of buffet. Now the aeroplane's beginning to tremble. Keep pulling, keep pulling. Mm -hmm. Pull. Feel it, feel it. And the aeroplane is now stalled. Okay. To recover. Yeah. Rudder to prevent further yeah. yaw. Yeah. Smoother with the power. Bring the nose up. Speed's good. Mm -hmm. Climb attitude, check forward. Recover is complete. Okay. All right, all right. It's always good to practice skills. Skills yeah. do fade. Yeah. The only currency rule mm. I'm aware of is the 90-day rule, yeah. which if you haven't flown in the last 90 days, yeah. you need to conduct three takeoffs, yeah. three landings and three approaches uh, before carrying passengers. Yeah. It has to be within what people can afford. Yeah. How far into the future does your work thinking take you in terms of uh, composite aeroplanes. There is a point where this generation of light aeroplanes will be obsolete yes. for airframe hours, for example. Oh, yeah. So how far into the future do you have to think? In terms of, of the enablers, we need to think as far ahead as possible. So part of the work we're doing on the experimental category, which mm -hmm. is to allow experimental aircraft, uh, only up to 2,000 kilograms, to be developed under the organisation that's developing them and, and uh, uh, remove the whole raft of CAA checking mm -hmm. and everything else at every level. That will enable more uh, development in, in the UK. Mm -hmm. There's an organisation that's developing an aircraft at the moment um, outside that scheme. It's the first aircraft developed in the UK for goodness knows how long. Where we go to with flight training, I, I, I don't know, but when a flying training industry is relying on 50-year-old aircraft and designs, mm. there is something wrong and something that's got, got to be changed. Now, over there is London. Yep. You can just make out the Wembley Arches. Yes, the football yeah, stadium. now I can see Foxy that. Uniform, yeah. take off your expression, Westerly 8 nine. Golf Sulu Victor at leaves in for rejoin. Golf Sulu Victor, overhead join, 26 left hand, which is active. QFB 1002. We'll get a few bumps when we're over those yeah, trees, no. just so you know, which always gets people excited, <laughs> including myself. <laughs> Golf Sulu Victor, short final to land. 
So my hand is always on the power, yeah. even if it's a crosswind. Which is slightly from the left. Keep the power on. It's an uphill runway, unfortunately. It's clear that Tony is on a mission to make GA more accessible by removing as much bureaucracy and red tape as possible. A thousand, thousand thank you. Thank you. That was really it was cool. Really, it was. It was good. That was uh, that was one for my logbook to say good. we went flying together. All right. More than anything else, I think it's the passion of the people uh, across the whole of the GA sector. Uh, one of the things I've been reminded about today is actually we, we refer to the GA sector, we refer to sport and recreational aviation as though it's a single entity. Uh, and yet again today, I, I can see that actually it's, there are so many different facets to it.